I'm Alan. Uh, thank you for coming. So this is a joint work with uh, folks from Johns Hopkins University, College of William Mary, Belfort Networks, and UC Berkeley. So in this work, we introduce a new practical mechanism to do load balancing on a data center scale and also showcase that the latest high-performance networking hardware like pro programmable switches can help storage clusters. So let me start. Today, large-scale cloud services need large storage clusters. Big players like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, and so on, their cloud services are serving billions of users around the world. So what behind these cloud services are some large data center clusters and storage clusters. However, the storage servers has load imbalance issue. So we learned from a paper back to 2012 from Facebook, publishing Sigmetrics, saying that the typical workloads to their uh, storage clusters are highly skewed and dynamic. So highly skewed means that there are only a few of very hot items being queried many, many times in the workload. And dynamic means the hot items are keep changing. So the skewness of the workloads bring imbalance to the backend storage servers. Assuming that using your, your class, uh, storage service are some like random partition-based uh, service like memcached and so on. So some server will get overloaded easily. So our motivating question is simple. Can we balance the server load? To solve the load imbalance issue, there are several solutions. First of all, let's think about consistent hashing. Seems like consistent caching can work for like static workload and balance the load for that. But in fact, it cannot handle the dynamic and the skewed workloads, which are currently the trend in the storage workloads. And traditionally, we can also consider using migration or replication. We move data around, replicate the data to many servers, then can help balance the loads. But you're moving data around, will cause large system and storage overhead. And if you want to make the data consistent, it also incur high coherence cost. Third, we can consider using a friend and cache as a load balancer. So what it means that you can place a friend and cache in front of a, a number of servers, and then this cache can observe the hottest items and also leave the less hot items to the backend servers. In this way, the loads will be balanced. The good part of this friend and cache is that it has low update overhead because there's only one copy in the cache, and it can work for arbitrary workloads. So in today's talk, we consider using caching as a load balancer. So peer review result back to 2011 in SOC, they have proven theoretically that if you want to balance the end servers in a cluster, you can simply put a small friend and cache in front of this end servers, and then you always uh, catch the hottest big O of unlocking items, then the server loads will be balanced regardless of the workloads. So this is a very cool result, but there is a requirement that this friend and cache should be as fast as aggregation of end servers together. So leveraging the result, there are some existing applications. For example, the result from NSDS 16, SOS, uh, SOSP 17, they're using the result to build a load balancer in one cluster and using the latest hardware like SSD or switches. But what if we consider a much larger scale, a scale with many clusters, for example here, M clusters, each cluster has N servers. Can we still use the same result to balance the loads? Seems reasonable. But let's look at some numbers. So assuming we have 32 clusters, and each cluster has 32 servers, and each server are serving like 40G throughput, which are like very typical numbers in modern data center, then your big cache node should be as fast as 41 terabits per second, which is clearly not scalable and practical, which implies that one big cache is not a practical way to do the load balancing for this scale. So let's try to solve the problem. So our insight here is, is that we can only use small cache nodes. If the small cache node can work exactly the same as the one big node, this is a big question mark. 
First, let's try to build a load balancer with small cache nodes. First of all, let's try to balance the load within each cluster. For example, put each uh, friend and cache in each of the cluster, and then the server loads within a cluster are balanced. However, the loads between the cluster are still not balanced. Some cluster can still receive massive loads and make imbalance. And then we can still reuse the periods that I just mentioned. We put another big node in front of this M big servers because each M cluster now has a friend and cache, and then it's balanced inside each cluster, and then it's become a big server. Then you still put the one big node to solve the problem. You cache the hottest M lock M items. The loads between the clusters are balanced, but still a problem here. This ugly big cache node. So instead of using a big cache node, we are proposing is called dist cache, which is a distributed cache mechanism to provide load balancing across the clusters. Basically, the key idea is that we do not need a big friend and cache, but we can split this big friend and cache into a number of smaller cache nodes, as long as the aggregation of the throughput is same as the one big node. For simplicity of the presentation, we split here, we split to M cache nodes, which is the same as number of clusters. And also, each cache node has the same throughput. But it can be heterogeneous as well. But I will show this later, that this cache provides a provable, practical, and a gen a general mechanism to do load balancing. So provable means we carefully analyze the theoretical guarantee behind this mechanism and show that it is robust for arbitrary workloads. Practical means this cache only requires very simple primitives, and it can be easily implemented in many scenarios. General means the disk cache mechanism can be applied to many storage scenarios. So let me start. The guarantee of the disk cache is the following. Disk cache is almost same as the one big cache node I printed before. We actually, we prove radically and also empirically that this cache support any query workloads to the hottest big O of M log M items. And each cache node will not be overloaded in this mechanism. And the cache coherence cost will also be minimized with the following requirements. This is the only assumption we need. The query rate for a single item is no larger than half of one cache node, which means a single query rate for a single item is no more than half of a cluster, which is pretty reasonable. So keep these guarantees in mind. We have the following design challenges for this cache. So the most obvious one is how to allocate this cache item. Once identified these hot items, how to cache them? That we do not want to overload any cache load, and we do not want to incur high cache coherence cost. The second challenge how to, once you allocate these items, how to query them. Now you have two layers of the cache nodes, how you can provide the best stable query distribution. Challenge number three, how to update the cached items. So in the update phase, we use a classical two-phase update mechanism. So we invalidate the item first and then update. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus how we address challenge number one and challenge number two. For challenge number one, how to allocate the cached items? We can consider two traditional strongman solutions. Once we identify some hot items, A, B, C, D, E, we want to cache them into, for example, up layer cache nodes. We can just do replication. We replicate A, B, C, D, E to all up layer cache nodes. Then the up layer will work exactly the same as one big node. Is the problem solved? No. Consider the cache coherence cost. If you want to update item A in the up layer, it needs to update to the all cache nodes, which means all copies in the up layer. It's not ideal. And then let's consider the other way. Let's just do partition. What if we have A, B, C, D, E? We want to partition based on some particular order. In this way, we partition A, B, C, you know, into the same cache node, and also co 
Incidentally, we also partition ABC into the same node in the lower layer. Then if ABC are really, really hot items in the workload, then there is some chance that it can overload both nodes and make the load still imbalanced. So what we do instead, it's quite simple, but works, is we're using two independent hash functions to allocate hash it hot items. We have H1 and H2. So in the first up layer, cache nodes, we're using H1, and then the hash name like A, B, C, D, E, and e, F into this particular order. C, D, F has been cached into the same cache node. But in the lower layer, we're using another independent hash function. So with, with constant high probability, the CDE will be spread out, will not be hashed to the same node again. So based on this, once you have some hot item CDF in the up layer, then you get more helper from the lower layer, which can spread out your cache loads. So we actually show that this provides stable and the best cache allocation, and also, if you want to update your cache, the coherence cost is, is simple, because one copy in each layer. It's much smaller than the replication. And change number two, how to query the cached items. So now you have two choices, two copies in both layers, right? So you can, for example, you want to query C. Naively, you can always query from the up layer first. But we show that query from the up layer first cannot guarantee the best throughput. Sometimes you need to query from lower layer first. So what we do instead is we're using power true choices to query the cached items. Assuming we know the loads of, for example, to, to get query to, to item C, we know the loads of both cache nodes that has this item C. Then in this case, we query from the lower layer first. In this way, our poor two choices can route the queries with the guaranteed stable throughput. So if you're interested in the proof, please read our paper. So let's put it together. These cache only have two simple primitives. When you do the cache allocation, you use two independent hash functions to allocate the cache items. And when you query the items, you base on power two choices with the current cache loads to route queries. So there are many deployment scenarios for this cache. So for uh, the cache node, we can just use like DRAM or SSD array to serve as the front end cache. And the server side can be just flash or disk. Now, you can also consider using emerging programmable switch which has much higher performance to do the caching. So, and then the server side backend service will be like DRAM based, for example. So to demonstrate the benefits of this cache, we consider a case study using programmable switch. So which means each of these cache nodes in two layers are programmable switch. So here you can see if there is a cache heat, so requested from the, the client cluster, then it will first go through the client side switch, which decide which cache node to access the item you want to access based on the power two choices. And then one of the cache nodes will reply with the cached item. In this way, we actually can tell you that this also improves the latency because you don't need to go to the backend. For example, we are using Redis. So you don't need to access the Redis server. You directly access the, the cache in the switches, which give you the end-to-end -end latency about the microsecond level, which is much faster than go to the backend server. And then if it's a cache miss, it will handle as the normal way. We'll go to the, the corresponding storage servers that run in the, the radius. So you, you could be like curious how we do this in the programmable switches, like serve the, you, you're using the switches as a cache node. We're actually using an open source language called P4, which stands for Programmable Protocol Independent Packet Processing, to program the programmable switch hardware. 
So I will give a quick high-level overview of how this implementation looks like. So the pro pro programmability from the switch gives you the power that you can define your own packet format. So on the left side, some existing packet header, you can uh, include the Ethernet, the IP, and TCP header. And the right side, based on your own protocol here, our disk cache needs like sequence number, operation, like get or write, the key and the value. And then the packet will go through a programmable parser to pass the packets and store them into some shared memory and go through a bunch of match action tables. After a bunch of match action tables, it will be reassembled in the deep parser. Let me give a quick example how this works. What if we want to get some items from the programmable switch? Then we send a request in a packet and go through the parser. And the parser will pass the packet in, in the shared memory, the Ethernet IP TCP, and operation sequence number number one, and operation is get, and the key is A, and now the value is none because you have a get operation. You, you haven't read your value yet. And then there are a bunch of programmable match action table. In a very high level, it works as the following. What if you match the action, the operation is get, then you, you do the action is like increase the get load. And then if also match the key you want to search is, is equal to A and this key is valid, then you access the register in your programmable switch to get the value of A. Once you get the value of A, then you write into your shared memory. Finally, this packet will be reassembled from the shared memory and reply back to the client. In this way, it's the whole process how a pro programmable switch to serve as the cache node. So let's do some evaluation. The setup is quite simple. We're using two uh, sub 6.5 terabits per second barefoot Tofino switches to serve as the upper layer cache node and lower layer cache node and client side switches. And we're using two uh, strong physical servers to emulate the storage servers and the client, ser uh, client servers. The baseline comparison we are compare are no cache, cache partition, and cache replication. So the key takeaway is for read queries, this cache works as good as replication. For write queries, this cache performs significantly better, which means when write ratio is reasonable, let's say less than 30%, this cache provides better throughput among all other baseline corporations. And once your write ratio is really, really crazy high, larger than 30%, it's as good as partition. So please know that it's uh, usually like the write ratio is about three to 5% in, in practice. So let me show some real figures. So here, the x-axis is different distribution. The y-axis is normalized throughput. You can see here, this cache works nearly perfect throughput for skewed workloads. Like, uniform is definitely balanced, but they find is some more skewed workloads. Then you increase, let's see, you increase the number of storage clusters, like increasing to like 4,000 storage nodes. This cache actually can scale linearly with the number of nodes. You can see it's work exactly the same as replication, which is pretty good. And also, for write queries, you can see here, for different write ratio with zip fan uh, 99's workload, the di di uh, this cache always offers the best throughput, especially one less than 30%, it beats all other baseline corporations. So let me conclude. This cache is a general distributed cache mechanism to ensure the load balancing across many storage clusters. And it only requires very simple primitives with independent hashing and pop 2 choices for routing. And then it provides near perfect throughput with very rigorous radical guarantees. So I'm end ending my talk now, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, uh, we have a little time, but if you have one or two questions, please come up to the microphone. Uh, 
Um, then I have kind of questions. Mm-hmm. Uh, it m- might be kind of naive, but I'm 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 curious. Like, if you want to generalize it for, if you, let's say you want to consider for the network latency, or for example, uh, crash uh, uh, crash or fault tolerance. Like, you want to make sure data was replicated properly. That if one of the node crashes, you can recover data properly. Is it possible to customize or justify or, 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 or adjust the, the the hashing function to reflect? Yeah, we actually have the the fault uh, tolerance uh, fun- function in, in disk cache, but we are we don't need to adjust the hash function. We just need to using a kind of a, like chain replication t- t- towards the, the the switch nodes, and then to make it uh, like we can guarantee like usually if your failure like one two nodes are fine. I see. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.